Happy Thursday. Welcome back to the Renaissance Era podcast. I'm your host, Jesse. It's a good day to have a good day, you guys. It is a great day to have a great day. Thank you so much for all the love given to episode one, which was really short, really sweet, but I had a great time doing it. I had quite the range of reactions to me putting a podcast out on my own, which was actually quite funny. Everything from congratulations, this is so exciting, to I want to be on your podcast, let's arrange something, to people blocking me and deleting me off of social media, which was surprising, but also not surprising at all, considering who did it. So again, shady, but we survive. If you haven't already subscribed to this podcast, please go ahead and give me a quick subscribe. It helps me do cool things over here. And I want to keep doing cool things. Today on the podcast, we're going to talk about the things that are currently making me tick. Because this is new and some of you might be new to me, the audience might be new to me, I figured I would give you guys some insight into things that I love, things that are making me happy, stuff I'm listening to, things I'm buying, because you will soon realize that I am a bit of a fashionista shopaholic. No shame there, but yeah, so I'm just going to jump right in. So music that is currently making me tick. I am a big music girly. I hardly ever have my phone off. It's constantly running out of battery because all I do is listen to music all day, every day. It makes me super happy. It's what I like to do growing up. And so this is where I hang my hat in terms of things that make my soul sing. And this is like the wildest range of stuff. So if you are the kind of person who hangs out in one genre of of music and never moves, that is not me. I am all over the place all the time with zero shame. The first thing that I have been listening to on repeat, and when I say on repeat, I mean it will probably be the number one thing that I've listened to this year, is Chris Stapleton's cover of Leanne Womack's I Hope You Dance. Now, this song normally gets me going no matter when I hear it, but the fact that Chris Stapleton did it, the first time I heard it, I cried. The second time I heard it, I pulled it off of YouTube and put it in MP3 generator so I could have it on my phone. He's so lovely about it. It's a wonderful wonderful cover. I would put it up there with Luke Combs's cover of Fast Car. It's just so good. The next thing I've been listening to is, and some of you might have noticed this too, it might not just be me, but Nelly Furtado is having her own renaissance, which I love. She is back in the public eye, back doing the thing, and she has put out her first new song in six years, and I am 100% a Nelly Furtado girly. I love Nelly Furtado. She's put out a new song with the Australian DJ producer, house music extraordinaire Dom Dalla, who I love equally on his own. Now, they premiered their new song, Eat Your Man, at Lollapalooza, and I immediately downloaded it. I have been listening to it nonstop, but that's not the one that made the headline for me because I love Eat Your Man. I will be listening to it while I work out from here to time in memoriam. However, they put out at Lollapalooza a remix of her song Maneater and Dom Dalla made it more dance and remixed it with Benny Benassi's Satisfaction. If you have not heard it, you need to go listen to it. If you just Google Nelly Furtado, Dom Dalla, Man Eater Satisfaction, it will come up somewhere. TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, somewhere. It is so good. It is so, so good. It hurts my soul how good it is. And the fact that we didn't have it before now is a crime. 
Other things I'm listening to is I've always been a big Colby Calais fan. I love her. And she's kind of been in this weird transition of not really knowing what she's doing. She was in a group for a while after she did her solo stuff. And now she's back to doing solo stuff, except it's more leaning into country. So I would probably classify her as like female Kenny Chesney at this point. It's very much like country on the beach kind of music, which I find really interesting. And you wouldn't think it works, but it totally 100% works. It's so good. I guess the full album comes out October 6th, which like is too long of a wait for me, but she has three songs out right now. And the two that I'm really into are Wide Open and Pretend. They are delicious. I've always been a Colby Calais fan, but it's like her old stuff, like bubbly, mixed with a bit more of like a country sound. And it just works. And it's so good. I know that sounds weird the way I'm describing it. But let me tell you, I would pay good money to see this live. 100%. In a total directional shift, I have also been listening religiously to the new 2023 Broadway cast recording of Sweeney Todd. And you're probably sitting here going, this sounds nothing like what you've just said. What is wrong with you? Background, if you don't know me, I was a musical theater kid the entire time I was growing up. I did theater in high school. I sang basically from the time I was 12 until I finished my first degree at university. I live for Broadway musicals, but more so than me just living for Broadway musicals, I live and breathe Josh Groban. Josh Groban is probably the best male vocalist of our generation. He is everything to me. I have seen him live twice. And every time it's better than the last time I saw him. Now, if you're a musical theater kid, especially if you're a musical theater girl, like it just seems to be one of those things about us that is universal. You have a weird obsession, relationship, whatever, with the song Joanna from Sweeney Todd. They've put out the Joanna Act 2 sequence. And I mean, Jordan Fisher is lovely. Everyone is fabulous in it. But Josh Groban, the first time I heard him sing the beginning of this on the recording, I almost crashed my car. It was so good. It is so good. Like, I I need to go see this. So I am wondering how to pool my resources to go in November on my reading break to New York to see Sweeney Todd. I know the tickets are astronomical. I will literally pay the grand out of pocket to sit front row balcony to watch Josh Groban sing this live. In another total direction change, there is this young up-and-coming kind of pop punker who goes by Knox, K-N-O-X, and he came out with this song called Not the 1975 that he had made based on a conversation he had with a girl at a bar. And as a fan of the 1975 and a fan of pop punk music, this speaks to me on a whole different level. It is catchy. It makes you want to dance. I bop to it in the car frequently. It is fabulous. And then finally, like everyone else, I am also obsessed with Noah Kahn. Everything he writes is gold. I've known about him for a couple of years, but I feel like everyone else is kind of just coming into understanding who he is because he really blew up on TikTok. I've known about Noah Kahn for a couple of years just off the basis of the fact that he's Jewish. I'm Jewish. So again, these things happen where one of your Jewish friends sends you the Jewish artist that they heard about from their other Jewish friends, and it kind of just makes its rounds. That's how I found about Noah Khan. One of my friends from Winnipeg sent me his music a couple of years ago and was like, hey, he put this out. You might like it. And I did. He is very much my speed. I like kind of soft, folky music. But he... I think last week or the week before, put out a song with Post Malone called Dial Drunk. And it is so good. Not to say that what he wrote before wasn't good. I mean, I love everything about Stixies and I love everything about Northern Attitude. That is my jam. But Dial Drunk has a different kind of feel to it. And I like this version of him that's collaborative. It's very cool. Moving on to podcasts that have been making me tick. 
So I religiously listen to all four of the podcasts that I'm about to talk about. This probably hasn't changed in a, like a year. This is where I have been podcast wise for about that long. So the first thing that I listen to is the Wellness Cafe with Trinity Tondelier. Trinity is a influencer, YouTuber, podcaster who lives in Vancouver, but is originally from Edmonton, Sherwood Park area. I was originally from Edmonton. So there's just that basis of understanding of each other right from the get go because we're from the same place. And I really like her podcast. It's about self-improvement, feeling healthy, dealing with criticism. She's really good at breaking things down. And she's one of these solo hosts like me. And she inspires me to try and be as good as her. And she's much younger than me. So like that makes me want to try harder because I'm old. (laughs) The other podcast that I'm listening to with which is like the exact same vibe, is the Hot Girl Energy podcast with Kaylee Stewart. Kaylee is my age. She's from Ottawa. She's fabulous. Similar topics to what Trinity talks about. A lot of health, wellness, beauty, exercise. That's totally where my headspace is right now. So she is lovely to listen to. Her and Trinity just put out an episode together talking about female friendships, especially in your 20s. And it's something that I plan on talking about on this podcast quite a bit. But that kind of helped me redirect my focus on where I want to go with talking about it, just because they have two polar opposite age group experiences of how that's been. And so for me, I'm kind of at the older end of my 20s compared to the two of them. So it would be an interesting thing to put into perspective. The next podcast I've been listening to, which is no surprise to anybody who knows me, is the Drama Queens podcast, which is a One Tree Hill rewatch podcast with the three actresses who played the three main characters. If you know me, you know that growing up, One Tree Hill was my entire life. I started watching it in junior high, but it meant more to me in high school, university, probably than then. Um, I am a massive fan of Sophia Bush and her character, Brooke, from the show. Sophia Bush seems like a wonderful human being. I want to be her friend. I obviously love the other two women on the podcast as well, especially hearing them talk about their experiences working on the show, which was a horribly toxic place to be. They talk about, you know applying that to other situations in life, life skills, standing up for yourself, but also hearing them talk through how they grew up on the show, dealing with things similar to their characters is really interesting to me because I just, I love One Tree Hill so much. The last podcast that I have been listening to religiously is the Girls That Invest podcast. This is hosted by two women who are both from minority communities talking about how to invest in the stock market, how to invest in real estate, working in companies, and I'm obsessed with it. It's funny, I was actually talking to one of my really good friends, Hamreet, about this podcast and the book that goes with it the other day. And I think that women aren't as financially literate as we should be. I think a lot of women are more comfortable because of what society has taught us to just hand off money-making decisions to men, which makes me violently uncomfortable. I think that we should all be financially free, and that can mean whatever you interpret as meaning. For me, that means that I am in charge of my own finances, and I have worked hard enough that if I wanted to, I don't have to work again. I'm a bit of a workaholic, I like school. I like working. So I don't think I could ever be financially free and then never work again. However, I like learning about the skills to make me financially literate, to make me financially free. Their advice has been really helpful when I'm trying to invest, which is really interesting. And I I feel like that's the other thing. I feel like a lot of people don't talk about investing, especially as women. I personally don't talk about it because I think people aren't interested. And also, I don't think it's anyone else's business that I invest, but I think we could maybe make it a more open thing. You don't have to tell people how much you're investing, what you're investing in, but I think we can talk about the fact that we should all be more financially literate and that we should all strive to try and 
you know, save money, make money. I think it's tacky to talk about in public in like actual numbers. Like I would never want my extended family to know how much I make, what I'm making, what I'm doing. I think that's a little bit yee, but I think talking about money in the workplace, talking about money with your friends as like a means of getting ahead and talking about, well, you know, I'm investing in the stock market right now. This is how I'm doing it. Like you could go through this platform if you wanted to get started. Well, you know, it's up to you what you want to invest in. Everyone's different. Everyone's a different type of investor. So it's really personal. So, you know, I wouldn't tell you how to do that. I think that's an okay way to address it. Moving straight on from that two books. The first book, again, I was talking to my friend Ham Reed about this, is Girls That Invest by Simran Kaur. And it is so good. I've read a lot of investing books written by men. As one does. I feel like most investing books are written by men. And we really need to change that. But this book is specifically targeting people in their 20s and 30s, women specifically who want to invest, who want to try and have a go at the stock market or, you know, EFTs, bonds, real estate, property, leasing, any of that. It's really interesting. I'm having a great time reading it. It's been really, really informative. And I like learning about the interconnectivity of everything that comes along with investing and watching who's trading what stock and learning about what public figures and billionaires are trading. And it's really, really cool. The next book that I'm like really vibing with right now is Under the Tuscan Sun by Frances Mays. I have read this book so many times, but I read it every time I go to Italy. I went to Italy in May and I took this book with me. I read it anytime I had like a five second chance to read just because I needed a mental break from the stimulus of the people who were on that trip with me. If you were on that trip with me, you know what I'm talking about. The stimulus. <laughs> and then I got home from our trip in May and I wanted to be back in Italy so bad that I just read it again. And now I'm like, reading every other book that Frances Mays has ever put out. I'm making all of her recipes. I'm looking at buying a house in Italy. Can I afford it? Absolutely not. But am I looking? Heck yes. And her writing is so addictive. She's so detail-oriented and describing her feelings, where she is, the colors of places, how they feel. It's fabulous. If you haven't read Under the Tuscan Sun, it is about a woman who moves with her husband to Italy and starts renovating this house. And they made it into a movie. It's a wonderful movie. Both of them are fabulous. Check it out. I love it so much. And this is so silly, but the last thing I'm reading is I'm rereading the Aragon series by Christopher Paolini. These books came out when I, a 28-year-old female, was in elementary school and junior high. There's four books. Aragon, Eldest, Inheritance, and Brissinger. And they were a wonderful series of books. They were fabulous. He's such a wonderful author. And they ended and everyone was really sad that we didn't get any other Aragon books. And Christopher Paolini last year announced that, you know, after so many years away from this world, writing other books, doing other things, he was going to finally come back and write more Aragon books. So we get the first in the fall, and then we get another one, I think, in 2024. And I'm so excited. It's like my teens have just like come rushing back to me. This was being published at the same time as like the later Harry Potter books, Twilight, um, anything by Veronica Roth, all of that. So I'm very excited that this is coming back. I'm hyped up. I didn't know how to class this next piece that I'm going to talk about. It's shopping oriented, but it's very random. I'm going to talk about specific pieces, brands, oddities. I'm classifying this category as random, but really it should be shopping centric. The first thing that I am absolutely salivating over is is the Coperni glass bag. It's ridiculous. And again, this just like speaks to how like wildly out of touch I am with my own bank account, but also like when would I use this? Anyways, 
Caperni is a very forward thinking kind of out of the box brand. They have really interesting bag shapes. Their clothes are very against the norm. They're in bright colors. I love Caperni. I don't own anything by Caperni. However, they came out with this glass bag. They are only made to order. They come in a bunch of different colors and they come in different sizes. So there's the regular size glass bag, the small size, and the mini. The color selection of the blown glass. Yeah, they're blown glass, handmade in France bags. The color selection is insane. So I, of course, was salivating over this and started looking everywhere for them and on their website. But I wanted to see if anyone else carried it cheaper because on the Caperni website, they are made to order and they're like $4,600 Canadian, which made me want to vom for a glass bag. Like it's one of those things where you know you're never going to wear it out of your house because it's made of glass. It is a pretty thing for you to have in your home for you to look at and to someday sell to a museum when you are on your deathbed, which I am happy with. That is ideal for me. Please sell all of my fashion items to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Do it. However, I went looking and I finally found one that is way, 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 way cheaper. Made by Caperni, carried by a different department store on sale. It is a mini glass bag in a clear baby pink combo. And when I saw it, I lost my marbles. I was, I lost the plot. I was gone. I showed it to my mother immediately, to which she was like, where would you wear this? And I explained that I would literally keep it in the box forever and then give it to a museum when I die. My father asked me what the investment value of it was, because if you don't know, if you're not a fashion girly, there are certain brands and certain designer pieces that trade better than gold or the S&P 500. Hermes makes such bags Chanel makes some of those bags. And occasionally you'll get a really rare piece where they turn over at a higher rate than a stock. So I went digging. And within two weeks of this bag being released to the public, there were resale sites trying to sell it for upwards of $15,000. So that lets me know they're making it in limited quantities and it's going to be an investment piece. I found it for under $1,500. So I am now in a dilemma with myself of whether or not I should be buying a Caperni glass bag as an investment, not to wear, but to look at and then eventually sell off. Again, things that only trouble me. Nobody else, just me. The next thing that I'm really enjoying is a brand carried on Net-A-Porter called Marquez Almeida. They are a smaller batch brand really cute stuff, kind of mid-tier designer, but the dresses they make are out of this world. They're really plain. They're really simple, but you can tell by looking at how they photograph. They're really well constructed and they're cool. They just feel cool. It looks like something someone cool like Jenna Lyons would wear. It's fabulous. I've been looking at their stuff for a while, but I think this year I might actually bite the bullet and get something just because I have lost the weight needed to fit into their brand. Again, not something you have to do, but something that I want to do. I want to lose my weight. And the stuff that they're coming out with this year really, really speaks to me. So that's something I'm going to keep my eyes out for. The other brand that I'm super into that's currently also on Net-A-Porte is called Aries. Again, They make really interesting small batch clothes. They're mid-tier designer, but they have really cool dresses. They come in different colors. They've got interesting shapes. And I am curious. So between those two brands, I will probably make a decision on one of them. If you see me at high holidays and you see me in a interesting looking dress, you know what's up. And then lastly, something that's making me tick in the shopping universe is the fact that Okay, if you've never met me before and you don't have any personal connection to me and you have no idea who I am, let me fill you in. In London, there are two main places I like to shop. The first is Selfridges. Selfridges is on Oxford Street. 
It's wonderful. It's very, very cool new designer. It is bougie, but you know what? I'm here for it. I love Selfridges. That is a bang up department store. The other department store that has grown on me is Harrods. Initially, I didn't like Harrods because of the attitude, but I feel like that's changed in the last five, six years. The last time I went to London, which was November of 2019, I had a fabulous time at Harrods. I also like going to London in November because everything is Christmas. Yes, I am Jewish. I was raised in a Christian household. I'll do both any day of the week. I love Christmas so much. I love like the feeling of it. I don't like the commercialization of it. I like what it's originally supposed to stand for, which is peace and love. And I like that people decorate really nicely. I will give them that. When people decorate really nicely, it gets to me. So as a result, I love going to Christmas shops. I love going to these department stores when they have full Christmas floors and looking at what they have. Harrods has opened their Christmas shop this week. So the week of August 10th in the year of our Lord 2023, they have opened their Christmas shop like a whole five months before Christmas. Like it's summer still, y'all. And the Christmas shop is open. I don't know whether or not I love that or I think it's insane, but I'm leaning towards love. I like someone who plans ahead. (laughs) And it feels right. Christmas in in the summer, we all could use some Christmas spirit. Some you know, be kinder to one another. Everything is beautiful energy, especially with what's going on in the world right now. So have I been trolling the Herod's Christmas shop page? Absolutely. Absolutely. I collect Wedgwood ornaments for my Christmas tree. I plan on someday having a Wedgwood tree in the corner of my house somewhere. And I am checking the page daily to see when they're going to release the 2023 Wedgwood ornaments. I am waiting with bated breath. And then the last couple of things that are making me tick right now are just like general life things, things that made me happy in the past couple of months. So first things first, this past week, I went for coffee with my friend Hamrit, and that was so good for my soul. Hamrit is a friend who started out as a co-worker when I worked for the university where I live. And we have just stayed the best of friends ever since. Me and her get along so well. She is so, so wonderful. And so we get together every once in a while and we go for coffee and we just talk about everything and anything and nothing is off the table. And it makes me so happy. So I saw her and it made my entire week. Everything was so good after that. The other thing is I was invited to my professor's house for dinner, me and my friend Carrie Ann, who went on my Italy trip with me. We were invited to the home of our professor and his wife for dinner because we are the elders from this trip. And I think they see us more as adults than as students they had on this trip. And I am so excited. I love them so much, but it's also just like exciting to see everyone again. So I am looking forward to that next week. I have been writing a new, a whole new B'nai Mitzvah curriculum. So I teach kids at my synagogue on the weekends. And I have finally, so I've been teaching grade one, two for the past couple of years. And I have been begging to teach the teenagers for years. And finally, this year, I get to teach the 12 and 13 year olds And I am so excited because things are shaking up and I'm new to the class. I am totally rewriting a brand new curriculum. I've had to write a curriculum plan. I've had to write lesson plans. I've had to do field trip forms. I've had the best time writing this. And I'm so excited to go to the approval meeting. I'm so excited to get started teaching these kids. I've been able to research for this. So I got to use all of my favorite special historian skills while I've been writing this curriculum. And I really hope they like it as much as I do, because I'm trying to balance the fact that Judaism will now recognize them as adults and they have to learn all of this Torah and Hebrew with the fact that they are still kids and I want them to learn in a way that's fun 
And for those of them who don't learn traditionally, I want them to learn in a way that they can process it and connect with it. So I've had a lot of fun doing that. And then finally, this is like a new weird thing for me is that I've started going to business meetings with my dad for our family business. And I love it. I never thought I would say that. I am a historian by trade. I like spending most of my days in archives with crumbly, dusty old books. I like talking about people who died 800 years ago. Like, that is my idea of a good time. But this summer, I've started going to these meetings for our family business with my father. And I actually really like it, which is bizarre to me. Because if you had told me that 10 years ago, I probably would have puked. I like learning about different companies. I like learning about acquisitions. I like learning about marketing. I've found out that I actually really enjoy marketing and brand marketing. I I don't know. I'm developing a new skill. And it's a skill that I didn't ever think I wanted to have. It's, it's interesting. So I'm hoping I get to do more of that because it's also a really nice thing to do with my dad. It's something that he can talk to someone else about in our house, not just, you know, people at work. He has someone else he can bounce ideas off of at home, which is really cool. So I'm really enjoying that right now. It's been really interesting. So these are the things that I've been enjoying in the past couple of weeks and things that have been making me tick, all sorts of random stuff, as you've heard. No consistency whatsoever, but that's where I am. That's how this summer has been. No consistency, everything up in the air, no plan panic all the time. But it's been good. Like, I wouldn't say that this is the worst summer I've ever had. I've actually had a good time with it. Things are changing. Life is changing. I think it's changing for the better. I'm really hoping it's changing for the better. I've got a good feeling about moving into the fall. So I've left voice notes open again. If you are listening to this in Spotify podcasts, if not, head over to Spotify podcasts and sound off. What are the things that have been making you tick? I want to know. Leave me a voice note and we can talk about it. I want recommendations for books and movies and music and anything and everything you could think of. So if you've been doing something that like really gets you going, let me know. Let's have a conversation. Again, trying to build a community. Let's do this. But that is it for this Thursday. So if you have not already, please make sure that you subscribe to this podcast. You can find me all over social media. I will leave everything in the episode notes. And I so look forward to seeing you bright and early next Thursday.